The Frontline documentary, American Insurrection, investigates the violent mob that stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. I speak with the film's director, Rick Rowley. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. For over 20 years, Rick Rowley has been covering stories of war, protest, and criminal justice. He was Oscar-nominated with co-director Jeremy Scahill for Dirty Wars that examines how the United States' war on terror caused its enemies to multiply. For several years, Rick has been covering the evolution of America's right-wing militias for the PBS series Frontline. The most recent installment is called American Insurrection that explores what happened on January 6, 2021. After the November election, Donald Trump and his allies continually spread the lie that Joe Biden didn't win a majority of votes to become president. On the day when votes were to be certified by Congress, Trump made a brazen attempt to steal the election by exhorting hundreds of followers to march on the Capitol. You'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing, and we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. American Insurrection is guided by the reporting of ProPublica journalist A.C. Thompson, who narrates the program. For years, A.C. and Rick have been seeking to understand what motivates the militia groups who spearhead the violence at right-wing rallies. A.C. interviews a member of the Proud Boys, Brian James, who leads the group's Indiana branch. James spent decades in white nationalist groups before adjusting his message. James tells me that by focusing on political enemies instead of racial ones, he'd gained more support. I mean, I've been doing what I'm doing here for 30 years, and there's normally five, 10 guys in the city, maybe 20 in the state. I have 200 right now. Wow. Yeah. He'd also found a powerful new ally in Trump. Well, you've got a guy who's a nationalist in the most powerful seat in the world. I mean, we've got a guy who's, you know, at least 75, 80, 90 percent on our side, and he's the president. There's no reason at that point to be uh, an extremist. You've been involved in right-wing movements for decades now. What was the time period that you found yourself having the most hope for real change? Now. Now. Yeah. American Insurrection first aired on Frontline last April and has been updated for the one-year anniversary of January 6th. You may wish to think of it as a piece of history, but it's also a harbinger of future violence as these vigilante groups continue to adapt. I reached Rick at his home in upstate New York. I asked how he became interested in American militias. I personally came onto it in kind of a, uh, a sort of unexpected way. Like 12 years ago, you know, I was, I was a war, working as a war reporter at the time, and it spent like a decade in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, um, and I started noticing something surprising. In record numbers, the soldiers from the wars I was covering were returning to the United States and they were joining anti-government militia groups. And these militia groups were taking increasingly militant stances against the federal government. And, uh, you know, it quickly became clear that this was not just a military story. It was a story about a rising far right movement in America that was still invisible to most of the country. So back then I, I started filming. I filmed with Ammon Bundy when he became the unlikely leader of the largest armed insurrection against the government in, you know, decades in Malheur and uh, Oregon, um, with, you know, militias in the Intermountain West who are training for civil war and with more dangerous groups, openly racist groups operating around the U.S. border. So these movements were kind of growing for a while. Um, but when Trump, you know, rode down the golden escalator, uh, he, you know, instantly provided a kind of focus, a focal point for this diverse kind of ecosystems of movements and brought them together in a way that we hadn't seen in my lifetime. And so at that point, um, 
uh, you know, before Trump's election, I, that was when I sort of first teamed up with AC because we knew that something, some terrible things were coming. So we were with film team in Charlottesville when Charlottesville happened because, you know, before it went down, it was unclear what this whole thing, if it was going to be anything at all. Um, uh, but it proved to be just this inflection point in, uh, in the, for the far right in the United States. And so American Insurrection, the film is kind of, is the story of the rise of far right violence in this era. And um, Charlottesville and January 6th are inflection points where the movement kind of changes and, and reaches a crossroads where it begins to change and transform into, into something else. So yeah, so we were, we were already filming then. Um, we did, uh, and we did a series of front lines along the way. We did two front lines, uh, you know, after Charlottesville and then another that unmasked this um, underground neo-Nazi terrorist cell called Adam Waffen. Um, and uh, those, uh, it was kind of, I, I mean, it's interesting working with Frontline, like, um, it, they had instant kind of impact. The, um, w when our, our first film on Charlottesville aired on Frontline, uh, like 10 days later, I got a phone call from the, uh, from the uh, U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia saying, you need to come down to Charlottesville next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, and in court, they, uh, they announced that they had arrested in, you know, seven different states, they'd arrested all of the people who were members of this underground group that we've been tracking. Um, and they like called out AC's reporting from the, from the podium, which I'd never kind of seen before. Um, uh, the same thing happened after our, you know, piece on Adam Waffen, the whole group was kind of wrapped up. And um, so it, it was been amazing to see like reporting in real time like this and having a films come out really that, that you, you see the instant kind of impact in the world around as they, as they hit. So take me back to a year ago in the lead up to January 6th, having followed this for several years, what was your team planning for on that, on that day? Yeah, well, we, uh, we expected uh, in, you know, sometime after the election for there to be a conflagration of violence of some kind. I mean, there was a whole uh, series of rallies in Washington, D.C. that culminated in January 6th. And, you know, no one, I mean, we didn't know which one of those it was going to be, when the match was going to be lit. Um, but it was clear that over, over that year, uh, there was this crescendo in kind of organizing. Because one of the... One of the things that is was fascinating to see is the way that, you know, it's easy to think about the far right or white supremacist groups as kind of monoliths, as groups that like they don't change. They're always there with their swastika armbands or whatever. But there are social movements that are constantly adapting and changing and masking themselves and, you know, um, and, which is important to understand so that you don't, uh, you know, so that you can know where the where the next threat is kind of coming. So immediately after Charlottesville, Charlottesville was in one on the one hand. Look, looked like a victory for white supremacist groups, right? I mean, they were out in the street in larger numbers than we'd ever seen. But the backlash was real and it was effective. Um, you know, the uh, activist groups mobilized in the streets and denied them, you know, they, they couldn't ever rally again because there were counter protesters that made that impossible. Uh, there were uh, civil lawsuits brought against all of the kind of major groups. They were hounded online and in the street. So all of the big public white supremacist groups uh, splintered, broke up, changed their names. Some of them went underground and became more militant. Many of them uh, took off their, you know, swastika armbands, wrapped themselves in the American flag and joined groups like the Proud Boys, um, who claimed, you know, distanced themselves from race, from explicitly racist politics and called themselves kind of civic nationalists or whatever. So that was, that was, so the movement, you know, those groups is evaded, went under the radar, right? Because they didn't look like what, they didn't look like the Klan, they didn't look like, you know, skinheads. Um, so those groups in the beginning of, uh, of, uh, 2020, they began to, um, began to emerge in the streets again, uh, well, emerge in the streets and become increasingly kind of visible and violent. So we expected, uh, as the election, you know, it, when it became clear that Trump had lost the election, we expected there would be violence of some kind. And we went to a series of, um, of protests in DC and what you saw, um, I mean, it was sort of chilling this increasingly uh, militant and violent um, uh, vigilante right-wing groups like the Proud Boys 
um, you know, fighting and, and being embraced by what looked like mainstream elements of the Republican Party. So a, a movement of these radical ideologies from the fringes more and more into the mainstream until on January 6th, uh, it was, you know, the line disappeared entirely, right? I mean, you saw um, people who were not affiliated with any, I mean, the majority, you look at the list of arrests, the hundreds and hundreds of people arrested. There's a handful of Proud Boys, some Oath Keepers, some Three Percenters, members, a few members of groups we've been, we've been tracking forever. The majority unaffiliated people who are just, mem you know, pro-Trump Republicans who, so people who have embraced a kind of insurrectionary violence that would have been unimaginable in American politics just a little while ago, um, being catalyzed and pushed by these more extreme groups into this kind of moment. So that was the, that was the terrifying thing that January 6th sort of ushered into existence, was, um, was kind of the mainstreaming of this sort of political violence. And did you have crews on the ground on January 6th? Yeah, we had we had a, a couple. We had two different cameras on the ground, and we're working with, you know, a, a bunch of other, um, you know, a bunch of other independent camera people who were who were feeding us feeding us footage and material. So, wh what was it like to to cover that day? I mean, in the in the reporting that I uh, have taken in about January six, feels like a a lot of uh, a lot of what's being sourced is cell phone footage uh, from uh, from people who are inside even more so than journalistic uh, footage. There were some photographers who were inside that day. I think of the videographer, Luke Mogelson, uh, who uh, had uh, video footage inside that day uh, published in The New Yorker. Um, but, I, you know, for for your crews, you know, what was it like trying to cover that? Well, yeah, I mean, it was, um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I was actually, I made the miscalculation and thought that inauguration day was going to be the day of the greatest, um, you know, activity. And so, uh, and we've been to three other of these protests, so I wasn't on the ground. Ford Fisher, uh, is, was a, you know, a associate producer who was working with us on this. Um, and he was there filming at the time and he went, um, uh, he's one of the, he has, basically spent the last five years kind of embedding himself inside of these movements and filming with them in the street. Like every time there's a protest, he's there live streaming it. So he's become a fixture of these moments. And so um, people recognize him and he operates with a little bit more kind of safety than, than many people do. But it was not, I mean, the reason why it's cell phone footage and a few still photographers is because it wasn't possible or safe for most uh, camera people to go inside. I mean, you, everyone has seen probably those images of the, the, the little, you know, area where all the cameras are set up for the for the live shots that cable news does all the time. They, you know, equipment was trashed, nooses were hung up, murder the media was spray painted on the door. Uh, you know, uh, there's a photographer who uh, the crowd turned on and was roughed up and like pushed out. It was, um, uh, it was a very antagonistic kind of place to film. We'd experienced sort of small, like um, less intense versions of that in the uh, in the other Stop the Steal rallies or the Milia Maga marches that had happened in D.C. before then, where, um, you know, as especially as day turned to night and the crowd became more uh, more aggressive, um, you know, they always, uh, you know, Turn, would turn on the cameras and, and, uh, and you know, accuse us of being either federal agents or, you know, uh, mendacious members of the, uh, of the, of the fake news. Um, so it was, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult beat to cover now. And that day in particular was one in which um, it was not, uh, it was not safe for, for many camera people to go inside. So in the course of the, uh, this reporting, your team, uh, interviewed Brian James from the Proud Boys, Mike Dunn from the Boogaloo Boys, but you did a uh, interview in uh, in jail uh, via video uh, hookup with Brian Croft, one of the people charged in trying to kidnap uh, Michigan's governor. Um, what did you learn from you know sitting down with uh, with, with people on the far right? Yeah, I mean, in each each of those 
each of those people are fascinating and have their own sort of parts of the story to tell. I think maybe one of the most telling characters in that kind of gallery is uh, is Brian James, who um, he's a, the the head of the Indiana Proud Boys. Um, uh, so he was, uh, you know, spent his life inside the far right and the racist right. Um, you know, he was uh, ran away from home at the age of 14, was a racist skinhead, joined the militia movement, uh, met Tim McVeigh um, when he was a part of the, uh, when, when Brian James was part of the Indiana militia movement and was so close to the center of it that he uh, got a warning over the ham radio a week before Oklahoma City happened telling him, uh, you know, something's going to happen. It's time to sort of go underground. After that, the militia movement was sort of discredited or it was difficult to organize as a militia member. So he joined the Klan for a while. Then he became a part of the Outlaw Hammerskins, one of the most violent, murderous uh, skinhead gangs in the country. Split off from that and started an even more violent faction. Anyway, he spent his life organizing in the most extreme elements of this movement. And he said, when Donald Trump's campaign began, he realized that, um, uh, he said there was no point in being uh, an extremist anymore because you can get 80% of what you want by, uh, by working inside the bounds of, of the system as it is currently kind of constructed. So he, uh, he stopped, he, he quit his uh, skinhead gang and started an organization called the American Guard, which he says is organized around the same principles. It's just calls itself a civic nationalist group instead of a white nationalist group. Um, and the Proud Boys were being started up at around the same time. And after Charlottesville, he joined the Proud Boys um, and rose to leadership inside them. And he says he has never, there, there's never been a moment in his life where he has been more optimistic about the possibility of victories for the racist right than he is now. Um, that he ordinarily in Indiana has, you know, 10 guys in Indianapolis, uh, 20 guys in the state. Now he has 200 and he has a national platform. Um, so, uh, you know, he, um, you know, and he still has like, you know, Nazi tattoos on his forearms. Um, I mean, he's doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't disavow the kind of violence that he participated in back in the day. Um, he just thinks it's tactically smart to sublimate your racist politics and, uh, um, and talk about things in, in other terms. And, um, and, you know, and is willing to, be a leader in a movement, you know, the Proud Boys is led by, was led by Enrique Tarrio, a, a Cuban American, a, a black man. Um, and he says, you know, that's, that is not a political contradiction for Brian James. He's like, the, his purpose is systemic. His goals are systemic, not kind of individual and small. So anyway, that looking at him and his evolution is a sort of a fascinating kind of window into how one element inside this movement has, uh, has transformed. But there are, there are others. I mean, it's a very heterogeneous kind of movement. The, the militia elements inside of it are, are their own kind of story and their own puzzle. Like Barry Croft and Mike Dunn represent that. So kind of a libertarian sort of wing where a lot of, you know, these militias, this, this new wave of the militia movement, it really um, sprang up during the Iraq War and the war in Afghanistan. And they, um, you know, are organized primarily around a libertarian politics that is uh, feels like the military has been, um, I mean, is is anti-war in a way, right? Feels like these imperial kind of, you know, battles in the Middle East are, are you know, wasting our soldiers overseas when we should be focused here. I mean, it's it's a complicated and, and sort of fascinating kind of um, uh, ecology of sort of social movements that at different times kind of come together. And, you know, this Trumpian era kind of, brought them all together in, a, in an explosive in an explosive way. So you described how Charlottesville was disruptive for a lot of these organizations. Members went to jail or were lost jobs because they uh, were uh, seen in footage or uh, ostracized in different ways. Um, what did January 6th do uh, to, uh, to these movements? I mean, now they're uh, ostensible leader Donald Trump is out of power. A, a lot of arrests have been uh, made. Um, there's continuing investigations. So what has that meant to those groups? Initially, there was a backlash to January 6th, much like the backlash to Charlottesville, except much faster and much more aggressive. 
I mean, it took months and months for the FBI to begin investigations into what happened in Charlottesville. Within a week, they had hundreds of people arrested after January 6th. Um, and the impact on, on all of the above ground groups was also swift and dramatic. I mean, the Proud Boys were, um, there were lots of Proud Boy arrests, the Proud Boys splintered, um, the, you know, they disavowed their leader, the groups all fractured, the same thing, similar things happened with the three percenters. Um, uh, you know, the organ most organized and visible movements there, groups there, um, were, you know, uh, were, were severely damaged. And there was like, there were, there were a few weeks where the broader political kind of movement on the right that had given them kind of cover and space and embraced them um, shied away from them. But very, very quickly, um, they have come back. Um, I mean, the, um, uh, the, so the, the, I mean, but they've come back in a different way. Um, the Proud Boys now uh, are organizing locally and not nationally. So while the national networks have been kind of decapitated, uh, the um, uh, the groups on the ground are kind of reconstituting themselves and reemerging. And that's what you're seeing now at local school board meetings around the country where armed armed militias and Proud Boys are showing up to protest against critical race theory being taught in, in schools or at, you know, um, at county health board meetings. Um, I mean, that this, uh, that is sort of where these, you know, energies are coming back together. And the, uh, you know, the, the conspiracy theory, the, the one, you know, one of the many, there, there are, there's a whole host of conspiracy theories that circulate inside these movements. But the one that January 6th was organized around, the idea that this was a fraudulent election um, that, uh, that was stolen, you know, by Venezuelan hackers or what, or, and working with the Chinese, um, that, uh, that has only gained strength. Um, and uh, there are actually more, more people now believe that the election was stolen than believed it on um, the morning of January 6th. Um, and, uh, and that is, uh, you know, that's, that's terrifying in many ways because, you know, I mean, some of the people who have been, uh, who were arrested after January 6th, there are, um, we've, you know, initially the DOJ wasn't releasing any of the evidence around these arrests. Uh, ProPublica around with, a, 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 along with a whole bunch of other groups sued to get uh, some of the video and audio materials released. And so we have access now to some of the, uh, the interviews that they've given. And, you know, they, um, some are repentant, they're sort of begging for mercy. And they say, um, you know, we, we believed that, that democracy was over, that had been stolen. And if you believe that, wouldn't you be ready to risk your life and, 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 and fight to defend the country and the system that you love? Like if you believe that democracy had ended and your country had been stolen. Um, and so if there are, right now there are millions of Americans who believe that. Um, and that is a very fertile ground for extremist movements and ideologies to kind of organize around. Another thing that's happened is that, um, is that these, this story, these narratives, um, that it's like zombie politics in a way. Like it doesn't matter. You know, they have been, they have faced defeat after defeat, right? I mean, the Arizona recount, um, you know, uh, ev you know, every single one of the lawsuits filed by Giuliani and everyone else. Um, but that doesn't matter, right? Because it's not a, uh, because it's a social movement and it's not, uh, you know, an organized conspiracy of lawyers or whatever. Um, and the social movement will continue. Uh, <laughs> I mean, will continue until something happens that saps its energy or, or, or defeats it. Um, so we're facing a moment, you know, a time of um, where these threats seem like they're inevitably going to increase. The uh, congressional investigation that's taking place into January 6th uh, right now and putting out subpoenas and uh, fighting battles in court to get people to uh, to testify. Um, wh what are you looking for uh, in that process? Or are, are there things that are coming to light uh, in that process that, you know, that you, you would have loved to know when you were making this, completing this film uh, last April? Well, you know, we are, uh, we just finished an update for it that is going to air on PBS um, uh, this week. And so we interviewed uh, Representative Benny Thompson, who's the chair of the, um, 
uh, of the committee, um, along with Representative uh, Schiff. And, uh, and it is, I mean, I'm, you know, like much of America, I'm, I'm eagerly anticipating what is going to be revealed, you know, by them with their powers to uh, whatever. They, they have investigative authorities that, that we lack as, uh, as journalists on the outside. Um, but, but I mean, I think um, it, feels, it, it feels to me, or I fear a little, that the focus is going to be on trying to, uh, trying to demonstrate a concrete conspiracy where there was a, a, a smoke-filled room with Donald Trump and two other people who, uh, who ordered his troops out and they like did this. And I don't believe that that is what we're seeing. I think what we're seeing is a far-right social movement that you know, is tapping into, um, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to fault lines that have been present in America for a long time and that, uh, and that it didn't, you know, it took a, it took a, you know, a spark maybe, um, you know, uh, it, they're like, there was a call made by Trump from the podium to go to the Capitol, but that beyond that, um, I don't think that there needed to be more concrete kind of planning to make this happen. I mean, the stage had been set, the narratives were circulating, the movements were growing, uh, they felt a call and they they took this kind of action. I mean, that that kind of thing is much more dangerous uh, than an actual, you know, a conspiracy of five people who like called the shots and made it all happen. Because, you know, you can, if you can demonstrate the conspiracy, you, you can arrest them, you can put them out of office, you can censure them, you can do all sorts of things. Um, this kind of far right social movement we're facing is, uh, you know, it's a much deeper kind of um, social problem we're facing in America and something that requires a much deeper reckoning to sort of deal with. Well, there is that question about how well organized January 6 was and what are the connecting points of uh, of organization and um, and you know, a factor in that is that inside um, the Capitol building, once people got inside, they didn't seem to have a real plan of action. Uh, and, you know, and, and I wonder, you know, how you interpret that. Yeah, I mean, so y you had different kinds of people going in. You, you know, you had a group of organized Proud Boys who wore the yellow hats and like were talking on radios and, you know, and a proud boy who broke the window, like uh, Pozzola, who broke a window that people like jumped in. But the weight of people behind them, the bulk of folks inside that building, you know, were, were wandering around like, like uh, amazed as stunned tourists taking selfies, of, you know, um, not knowing which hallway to rush down. Um, uh, you know, there were some people who moved, who seemed like they knew what they were doing, but the bulk of the, of the people there were, um, were suddenly radicalized to a kind of violence that would have been incomprehensible to them probably a week before and might be hard for them to even, even justify now in their minds. I mean, th this is, you know, it's, it's, it's what some of the people who've been arrested for their actions, they are saying now that they, that in that moment, you know, whatever, that they can't now even even imagine the justifications that would have made it possible for them to do what they do now. I mean, that's, you know, and that's a thing that happens when, um, when societies are in moments of, of upheaval, like people in an instant are capable of, of rapid radical transformation. I mean, it's a thing I've seen like around the world and all sorts of places. There are moments when society feels like it's on the verge of collapse and people are suddenly capable of acts of, you know, I mean, heroism on the one hand and evil on the other. I mean, their their subjectivities instantly sort of transform in these moments of instability. And we are in, I mean, there's been very little stability in the last couple of years. And it, it you know, I mean, shows no sign of returning immediately. You talk about how these groups are constantly morphing uh, in their goals and um, and identity. And one of the things that you chronicle in American Insurrection is a morphing in the attitude towards police. Um, you know, at uh, at one point, a key symbol of that right-wing thinking was the Blue Lives Matter flags and, you know, support for police, uh, uh, you know, in contrast to, uh, to other protesters. 
something seems to have shifted uh, in 2020, where you chronicle the case of uh, Stephen Carrillo, who uh, targeted a federal officer to, for assassination. Um, and uh, and then, of course, in the case of January 6th, um, you, you see a lot of violence against uh, uh, Capitol Police. Um, what, what do you make of that shift? Yeah, that's so there is always in the far right and the white supremacist movement been two attention between two different contradictory kind of impulses, right? There's um, vigilantes, like going back to the days of the Klan, right? You have elements that are vigilantes that see themselves as we are going to defend the social order and do the things that the police are prevented from doing. We're, they see themselves as a, uh, an auxiliary arm to the police or whatever, and we're gonna you know, enforce, enforce the social order. Then, especially after the Vietnam War, in the, on the right, you see a rise of insurrectionary violence, right? Um, you know, Tim McVeigh uh, is you know, the most obvious incarnation of that, but like, that's what the skinheads are, that's what white Aryan resistance is, uh, the modern neo-Nazis, like all those groups, they're not on the side of the police, they, they think, the whole society is rotten and anti-white and we need to blow the whole thing up and start over. So those, um, uh, and that was the dominant kind of ideology in the extremely far right for, from the Vietnam War up until relatively recently. So under Trump, what you saw w w was the emergence and sort of dominance inside the far right of uh, the vigilante side of the far right for you know the first time in like a while. Um, and so that's um, groups like the Proud Boys who uh, are the, uh, the Proud Boys are the most clear kind of incarnation of all this. They go out to defend the police and to fight against anti-police protesters and they posture themselves as defenders of like the social order. And that, uh, so over the, in, over the course of November and December after the elections in Washington, DC, in the three protests that happened there, you saw them transform. With Trump out of power, they went, uh, you know, over the course of three nights, moved from being, um, you know, we would see them at the beginning being incredibly deferential to the police. So they're, you know, trying to fight with Antifa, you know, people who are there um, ripping down black men. Whenever a police line shows up, they'll back off and say, back the blue, you know, that's not us. We, you know, we're here, we support you, you know. Um, by, you know, the second night, um, they start pushing the police and fighting with the police. And by the time uh, January 6th comes around, you know, they're burning Blue Lives Matter flags and going out and, and beating uh, um, police into comas with fire extinguishers and crushing them in, uh, uh, in revolving doors and in, you know, I mean, openly fighting uh, police in, a, in, a, in, a, in an aggressive way in the street that I've, I've never seen before. Do you think that has uh, you know, meaning for the future? Or do you think that yeah. was specific to that incident? No, no, that, that is, I mean, I think that that is the future, right? That that is um, with Trump out of power now, um, that those, uh, it has clarified and reunited that sort of element of the far right. That, um, uh, I mean, you, you see sometimes strange sort of contradictions, like in the militia movement, which is very anti-federal government, you will sometimes see them rallying around a local sheriff, like, you know, and seeing like local law enforcement is somehow, you know, uh, the sovereign kind of realm of the citizen, whereas the federal law enforcement isn't. So th that sort of stuff may still exist somewhere, but the um, uh, groups like the Proud Boys are now firmly in the insurrectionist, like anti-government camp. You started this conversation by saying that what drew you into this world was following U.S. military veterans as uh, they came back from wars abroad and found their way into these uh, right-wing groups in the U.S. And in your film, An American Insurrection, uh, you interview uh, Congressman Keith Ellison, who uh, talks about a, a need to identify extremists in the U.S. military and and root them out because essentially the U.S. military is uh, giving top level training to people who are turning around and attacking the U.S. Capitol. What is what's been the aftermath of uh, of that of of focusing on 
um, extremist members of the U.S. military or uh, local law enforcement? Yeah. So this is uh, just I, I want to give just a little bit of context to this whole thing. So the. Um, uh, there has there has always been a strong correlation with uh, America's foreign wars and rise and, and a rise in domestic white supremacist activity. In fact, the one thing that correlates better than better than any other social factor with a rise in white supremacist violence from you know from the second wave Klan up to Tim McVeigh is uh, is soldiers returning from a foreign war. Um, better you know better than economic downturn, better than antagonism against immigrants, better than anything. Uh, and the leaders of far-right groups from George Lincoln Rockwell and the Nazi party to Tim McVeigh, Tom Metzger, Louis Beam, everyone in between, you know, uh, dominated by, by veterans. And, you know, in, in the insurrectionists in uh, the Capitol, the rioters in the Capitol, uh, you know, there were, uh, like, there were a handful of Proud Boys, there were some Oath Keepers, but the group if you were going to find a group uh, that was really overrepresented there, were, were, were veterans in that you know, group as well. So immediately after January 6th, the military uh, acknowledged that they had a problem with, with extremism in their ranks and they you know, had a stand down, did, did a whole bunch of historic uh, you know, measures that they hoped would kind of combat extremism in the ranks. And you know, it remains to be seen what, uh, what the impact of those will be. Um, but, um, it is, uh, uh you, you know, know when, but, when you, when you, when you describe that to me, it makes me think of, uh, you know, young people who are recruited to war, trained for war, go through the, the, that intense experience and then come back and are looking for some to channel that intensity into, into something else. I mean, there are there are a lot of different kind of social theories uh, about why there is this correlation. One of them is one of them is what you're saying, like um, this idea of being you're you're incredibly mission focused overseas. You have a your goal. You're defending the country. You come back home and there's no place for you. Your skills don't really translate into anything that makes you employable in the market here. You've lost focus. No one cares about you, and you are looking for another mission that, that is, um, you know, that makes you, gives you the kind of importance and meaning that you had when you were in combat. Like that's, that's one thing. Um, another thing that is, you know, commonly voiced by veterans who I've spoken to who are parts of these militias in different parts of the country is uh, a feeling of betrayal that, um, you know, especially in Iraq, um, you know, I mean, everyone, uh, you know, a, a few years into that war, everyone knew that it was a lie and that it was um, that they were risking their lives for, for a lie and that they were the, the, the government they were defending was hated by the people who they were with and they were, they had become the bad guys. Um, and so that kind of returning from that sort of feeling of betrayal engenders all sorts of, you know, animosity against the government. Um, other things uh, that, you know, people look at are the way that, uh, in some cases, the populations who you're uh, being sent to fight against ha are dehumanized, right? Um, they're, you know, uh, soldiers are sometimes used slurs to speak about the Iraqis or the Afghans, who, you know, and that there's a, a mindset that is built in that um, that finds that resonates with uh, racist or far right kind of, you know, language and they come back. There's also, you know, the demographics from which soldiers come. I mean, there's a whole host of factors, um, you know, that, that people are, you know, look at when they talk about how this, uh, how this happens. I mean, the one thing we know is that it does, right? Um, and, uh, um, and it's, uh, I mean, it's my hope, actually, that with the drawdowns in Iraq and Afghanistan, that some of the, some of the deep kind of sub- um, subterranean energies that were driving this kind of movement, maybe that, maybe some of that will be sapped in the years ahead. I mean, we'll, we'll kind of have to see. You no longer will have hundreds of thousands of, of young Americans cycling through these war zones. And perhaps that will, you know, over time, um, turn the kind of temperature down on some of these movements. I mean, we, we can hope that that, that may happen.
want to thank Rick Rowley for speaking with me. His film, American Insurrection, with ProPublica correspondent A.C. Thompson, is available from Frontline at pbs.org. Thanks to our team, series producer Anna Nordenswan and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pure Nonfiction. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at THOM Powers. You can read our show notes and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. Thank you.